Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the first European Parliamentary Research Service Policy Roundtable for the year 2022. My name is Anthony Teasdale from the EPRS, and it's a great pleasure to welcome already over 115 participants online for this discussion. And we're going to be looking at what we call 10 issues to watch in 2020, challenges and choices beyond coronavirus. And they're based on this document, which is being produced by 10 of our EPRS policy analysts, which look at a range of issues. Every year we try and do this. And this year we're looking at uh, a selection from what's gonna happen in the conference on the future of Europe, to supply chains for semiconductors, to the monetary policy of the European Central Bank, to the future of the internet of things, and many, many other subjects besides. We try to have these policy roundtables about once a week. The next one, in fact, is coming up already next Monday, when we will be inviting think tankers from both sides of the Atlantic to speculate about how President Biden's second year is going to play out. What will 2022 bring in US politics? And then next Wednesday, uh, we have a lunchtime discussion on stress testing of EU policies, how to make the European Union system more resilient in terms of policy design and policy delivery. So, in fact, we get off to a very fast start right at the beginning of the new year, and it's a great pleasure uh, to have these conversations, really, to try and improve and try and refine the quality of policy discussion in our institution and more widely within the European Union institutions. We're particularly privileged to have to set the scene and introduce today's um, conversation. Uh, Otmar Karas, Member of the European Parliament, he's been an MEP from Austria since 1999. Uh, recently re-elected to the Bureau, he's now the first Vice President of the European Parliament. And his responsibilities at the moment include into ALIA Information and Communication Policy, uh, the Members Research Service and Library, both of which are housed within EPRS, relations with NATO, the OSCE, the World Bank, and the IMF. A former member of the Austrian Parliament, here in the European Parliament, he's a member of the Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, the Econ Committee, and the Parliament's Delegation for Relations with the United States. So who better to set the scene and really uh, identify and ventilate some of the issues which are likely to confront us as as policymakers and opinion shapers in the European institutions over the coming year. Over to Vice President Karas. And thank you so much for joining us and sparing time in what I'm sure is a very, very, very busy day to be with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde, dear Anthony, cher Etienne, welcome back to our annual reunion. For the third time in this legislature, previously as vice president responsible for the European Parliamentary Research Service, you mentioned it, today as first vice president, I have the pleasure and honor to open this online policy roundtable. I always look forward to this event focused on 10 issues to watch in the year to come. And I know many of you do too. Indeed, who does not want to hear the latest research on what the new year might bring? Who does not want to hear the latest analysis of where, where to focus their attention? Who does not want to understand the challenges and choices beyond coronavirus? To echo the title of our event. Let us look around. Let us listen to our families, friends, fellow citizens. What do we notice today in Europe? We see a split society, a divided society, on so many issues from migration to vaccination. We see a split society in the media. We probably experienced it too just one month ago during the holiday, when we were back in our home countries. This is not in Europe only. Let us remember one year ago how divided the US was with the attack on the, the capital. These are not accidents. Extremists are looking for conflict. 
extremists are looking for division, for polarization. Of course, they are because extremists prosper on conflict and division. What can we offer as a response? My answer is clear and very easy. We need to listen to citizens. We need to look for solutions to their problems. We need to implement these solutions. Let me put it in other words. We need to reach out to citizens. We need to build bridges between citizens and policymakers. Bridges unite. Bridges can be crossed both ways. I find the symbol of the bridge very fitting. It might be because I was born by the Danube, the longest river in the European Union. Growing up by a river that unites ten countries matters. Bridges are important all over Europe. They have united countries and citizens since antiquity. Bridges embody Europe. So much so that they have been one of the symbols on our Eurobank notes for 20 years now, as we have just celebrated our currency's 20th anniversary. We usually see bridges as uniting people, bringing countries to closer, and they immediately targeted and destroyed when war start. Europe has a long, a very long tradition of building bridges and rebuilding bridges. Let's go one step further. Many bridges were built over troubled waters, over rapids or impossibly large rivers. If the human brain and hands have been able to design a build and build bridges over impossibly large rivers, we can certainly find solutions to many of today's issues. I am thinking of the European Green Deal with climate action, sustainable agriculture and shaping the recovery as explained by our policy analysts or securing supply chains. To name another of the 10 issues to watch in 2022. If the human brain and hands have been able to set pillars in and build bridges over troubled waters, we can certainly set standards in the troubled waters of cyber competition for the Internet of Things or in the troubled waters of inflation for monetary policy or in the troubled waters of geopolitical tensions for European defense. To name a few other issues to watch in 2022. Bridges are the archi archi architectural symbol of dialogue. From our landscapes to our banknotes, they are a most useful, useful reminder that dialogue can overcome division. Dialogue can unite. Dialogue is the foundation of democracy. This leads us to another of the 10 issues to watch, a key issue. What to expect after the conference on the future of Europe? This will start in 2022, but it will not end in 2022. The European Parliament has to lead the debate after the conference on the future of Europe. Everyone is responsible. Today's event is an opportunity for dialogue between our policy analysts who have researched these 10 issues, members of the European Parliament, thinkers, stakeholders and society at large. I am looking forward to listening to you. Let us get started. Thank you. Vielen Dank.
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Vice, Vice President Karras, for those inspiring words. And thank you for setting out not only some of the key issues which face Europe and doing so so effectively, but also setting out a philosophy of building bridges between our between our countries and uh, indeed our peoples. Uh, that's a great way to set the scene and to kickstart our discussion this afternoon. That discussion is going to be uh, chaired by Etienne Basso, the director of the Members Research Service within EPRS, and it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Etienne. Thank you very much, Anthony. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for your powerful introduction and for the support and the very encouraging words towards uh, the EPRS. I'd like to, to welcome, of course, the, all the speakers here that are in their home or in their office here in the parliament uh, due to the very special uh, situation in which we are living. Uh, it's the second time that we have these uh, this, uh, 10 issues to watch online. But here we are. I'd like to also to welcome our numerous audience online, either on the WebEx application, but also uh, on the web stream. And since we're still in January, I wish also everyone uh, a happy new year. Uh, the 10 issues to watch uh, is a selection um, of a, a selection of issue that is the result of a collective thinking by the analysts within the Members Research Service. So in no way, as we know, it's a manifesto. It's just uh, the things, the issues that we consider that are going to matter in uh, the year to come in 2022 and in what we expect to be uh, the post-COVID uh, era. So what we're going to do today is short presentations by the 10 authors. Gives you just a look at uh, the publication that I encourage you to, to read. It's also online in three languages. Uh, and then after this presentation, we will have a discussion. Uh, and I already encourage you to use the chat functions if you want to share your ideas or if you want to put some questions. Let us start now, and I would like to start by our first topic, uh, looking at the question of uh, inflation rate, uh, and to discuss uh, monetary policy in the year ahead. Uh, and I would like uh, to invite uh, Martin Hoffelmeyer, who is an analyst in our economic policies unit, but has been also working previously uh, in the European Central Bank and in the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, to introduce the subject uh, how much the European Central Bank is caught between a rock and a hard place. Martin, why is it like that? Over to you. Thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, indeed, the ECP is set to face a, a difficult task in the near future to strike the right balance on one side to ensure favorable financing conditions to support the economic recovery, and on the other side, uh, to address inflationary concerns. Okay, but, but how did the ECB get into this, uh, this tricky position? To answer that question, I think we need to look at both sides, and let's start with the financing side. The ECB catered for very favorable financing conditions in the last couple of years, but in particular in the last two years in order to respond to the economic effects of the pandemic and to support the economic recovery from the pandemic. And as we all know, uh, also governments intervened decisively and so fiscal debt built up. Now, a sudden or an unexpected policy reversal by the ECB could not only cause a severe finan uh, downturn in financial assets, but it could also lead to tighter financing conditions for member states, and this could in turn impede the economic recovery. On the other side, if we look at inflationary concerns, um, as we all uh, read in the news, inflation rates have soared in the last couple of months. The latest inflation reading is above 5% for the EU and the Euro area, and this, of course, is significantly above the 2% target and also a record high since the beginning of the monetary union. Therefore, tighter monetary policy, meaning, for, for instance, increasing interest rates, could be indispensable if, if inflationary pressure proved to be more persistent than expected. Uh, 
as we know, um, uh, price stability is the primary target of the ECB. Now, the big question, of course, is uh, whether inflation has reached its peak or whether we will uh, see further uh, inflation increases. Taking into account the high levels of uncertainty, you can find an attempt to answer this question in our publication. Now, balancing those two sides, the ECB already gave a, a glimpse into a likely sequencing of its exit strategy, and that is ending net asset purchases before raising interest rates. In its December monetary policy decision, the ECB conceded that indeed inflation will remain above the 2% target for most of 2022, but it expects prices to ease in course of this year. And it will also end its asset purchases through the pandemic emergency purchase program as planned in March this year. In conclusion, that means that the ECB has to walk a delicate tightrope this year to be flexible enough to lean either way towards the rock or the hard place. Uh, most certainly, it will be a, a balancing act and something to watch out for in 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this very effective uh, introduction. We understand that the uh, ECB will have a very crucial role for the recovery in the next weeks, months uh, and years. And this is certainly uh, something we're going to watch and continue to watch in the EPRS uh, in 2022. Uh, another very central element uh, for this recovery is, of course, the recovery plan. And as you know, the Council adopted the EU recovery instrument in December 2020. And I'd like to uh, give now the floor to Alessandro D'Alfonso, who is the head of our newly created NGEU service within the EPRS, we created a special uh, entity uh, to work on this issue. And I would like to ask him, why is uh, Next Generation EU going to be so important in 2022, and especially how it's going to go with the uh, national plans? And if you could give us also a few examples of what's going to happen and what is planned uh, next year. Over to you, Alessandro. Thank you, Etienne. 2022 is the first year of full deployment of the Next Generation EU or NGU recovery instrument. As we have heard from Martin, risks to the economic outlook persist. In such a context, NGU can make a real positive difference. Why? Because NGU is not only about financial resources, but also about channeling them towards measures that can help our economies and societies emerge from the crisis stronger than before. Three priorities have been identified. First, the green transition. Second, the digital transformation. Third, inclusion and resilience. These priorities may sound abstract, but the recovery instrument is designed to translate them into investments and reforms that deliver concrete results for EU citizens and businesses. Let's look at three examples. For resilience and inclusion, Estonia is devoting 30% of its national plan to the construction of a major medical campus and the reinforcement of medical helicopter capabilities. These measures will improve access to medical care for two thirds of the Estonian population. In Austria, half of the plan will contribute to the digital transition. With connectivity currently below the EU average, measures include expanding broadband access throughout the country, not least in rural areas, and delivering digital devices to all pupils in lower secondary education. The Italian plan includes a major investment in energy efficiency through the renovation of 100,000 residential buildings. Corresponding on average to 500 buildings renovated per week, this is a significant contribution to Italian decarbonization efforts since uh, buildings uh, represent uh, almost half 
of the country's energy consumption. These are just three examples, but there are hundreds of others across the EU. The challenge of implementing such ambitious plans by 2026 is huge, but so are the benefits that they can bring to EU citizens and businesses. To conclude, NGU is an opportunity that the EU cannot afford to miss, and 2022 is a crucial year for gaining momentum in delivering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, for, for presenting this uh, extremely important step forward for the for the European Union and also for giving these examples. I'd like also to highlight uh, the, the point that we, we do in the EPRS analysis on every single national plans for recovery. Uh, some of them are already available online. I encourage you to uh, to make good use of them. Uh, the initial documents are very heavy, and if you go for the EPRS version, it's uh, really a handy way to approach these very complex issues. Um, you mentioned, Alessandro, in your presentation, uh, this sort of twin objective of digital and green, uh, green transition, digital transformation. I'd like to dig in uh, in these two elements. First of all, by uh, looking at uh, the green recovery from the perspective of the agricultural sector. As uh, we know, the common agricultural policy is one of the uh, oldest policies of the Union, 60 years. Uh, it has been reformed recently. It's also, I think, the second major spending, so it's extremely important. And it has been reformed recently with the, the sense to um, take more into account the uh, uh, ecological elements and the green transition. So I'd like to ask uh, Raquel Rossi, who is policy analyst in our structural policies unit, uh, to uh, look at this issue and to uh, tell us uh, how much uh, uh, we should focus on agriculture this year uh, in the context of the re green recovery. Over to you, Raquel. Thank you, Etienne. As you said, the year 2022 is important for agriculture because it marks both the 60th anniversary of the common agricultural policy and the crucial step towards a more sustainable agriculture. Over these past 60 years, the common agricultural policy has reached a number of objectives, such as supporting EU farmers and securing food supply to EU citizens. But these objectives have been reached at some environmental costs. We all know that agriculture needs to alter the environment to produce food. But nowadays, the level of alteration is too severe, so that agriculture is contributing to putting at risk its own production capacity. This is visible in the decline in biodiversity, in the climate change, and in the deterioration of natural resources. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that agriculture needs this quantity of clean water to produce a certain amount of food. In some areas of Europe, due to the overuse of water because of bad irrigation practices, water reserves look more like this second glass. In other areas, uh, due to the leakages into the ground, uh, due to the overuse of agrochemicals on the fields, such as uh, fertilizers, water reserves are polluted and they look a bit more like this other glass, a bit scary. So what will happen in 2022? Uh, at the end of 2021, the EU legislators um, agreed a reform of the common agricultural policy, which may go into the direction of more sustainable farming. Uh, the EU member states, the EU countries, have prepared strategic plans in which they define how they would like to use EU funds uh, to uh, to reach EU level objectives based on their local uh, situation. And these plans involve a lot of, um, the, the new policy involves a lot of flexibility and the great scope of, uh, for voluntary action towards uh, sustainable agriculture. So, um, how much um, 
uh, how much ambition the EU countries will put uh, in choosing the measures which go into the, into the direction of uh, more sustainable agriculture. Well, this is what uh, we will be watching for out for in uh, 2022 waiting to know if we can make a toast to the 60th anniversary of the common agricultural policy with a glass which looks more like this one or the polluted one. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Um, uh, let's stay in, uh, let's stay in this uh, green transition. Um, and we just heard why the agricultural sector is one of the of, of the of many that will uh, we will need to see some changes in the upcoming year. But there is another uh, another important element. Very often, uh, economic growth has been associated to pollution. Uh, it is no more true in the same way. And um, this is the question of a radical decoupling between growth and uh, CO2 emission or greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, Enrique Simonge, who is uh, with us in our uh, service dedicated to climate action, is uh, an analyst that has looked into this issue. It's a fascinating issue, and I would like to ask him to uh, take us through uh, his thinking uh, about this. Over to you, Enrique. Uh, thank you, Etienne, for the, for the introduction. It is true that in 2022, the relation between economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions needs to change. If we are to reach climate neutrality by 2050, it is imperative to radically decouple economic activity from greenhouse gas emissions. The European Green Deal aims at ensuring that the Union will be able to achieve economic growth while reducing resource use and at the same time being able to reach the net zero emissions and the 2030 target of minus 55% emissions compared to 1990 levels. In between 1990 and 2018, the global economy grew by close to 280%, while emissions grew by 54%. This relation between both variables highlights the concept of relative decoupling, where both economy and emissions grow, but at different rates. In the European Union, there is evidence of absolute decoupling, a process and state where the, econ where the economy grows and emissions decline. Climate policymaking has been supported by production-based emissions accounting, which considered those coming from the production of goods and services within a given region. This approach fails to include indirect emissions related to imports and exports. This shortcoming can be addressed through the application of a consumption-based emissions accounting methodology. Irrespectively of the accounting method, radical decoupling needs to occur. That is, economy needs to break the remaining link with greenhouse gas emissions. This can be achieved through behavioral and lifestyle, and lifestyle changes, new technological developments, massive reoccurring investments, and through further research and developments. Economic growth is usually measured by assessing variations in the gross domestic product. This metric has been around for many decades now. Nevertheless, many have, have argued against it, and new metrics have been proposed, such as the natural capital accounting, the human development index, the genuine progress indicator, and the Appy Planet index. Like with the emissions accounting methods, irrespectively of which progress metric to be used, in 2022, there is the need to cut greenhouse gas emissions and keep them down. This is also valid when addressing the need for the existence of economic growth, as many proposed post-growth approaches, such as degrowth or slow growth. Uh, to conclude, we started 2022 with all the Fit for 55 proposals already presented by the Commission. It is therefore a key year for societal and economic progress accompanied by further reductions of greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Etienne. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique, for highlighting the importance uh, of this transformation uh, and also the role of Europe and the leading role of Europe in the world uh, as a standard setter and also uh, as looking forward for new solutions. Uh, I mentioned the uh, green transformation. Another uh, objective uh, is of course, the uh, technological transition. Uh, and uh, I would like to move to this now. Uh, 
uh, with uh, Mikhail Adam, who is the head of our digital policies unit, and look at a particular issue, which is uh, the Internet of Things. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, uh, Michael, uh, you are heading this new unit on digital policies in the in the EPRS. Uh, if you can explain to our audience what is uh, the Internet of Things and why it is so important. Yes, with pleasure. The Internet of Things refers to the connection of devices and objects to the Internet. For example, a self-driving car that connects with traffic systems or with other vehicles, or a fridge that automatically orders food supplies over the internet, or for industry, a container that checks itself in automatically at a port terminal. Okay, that's very concrete. Uh, and uh, what is the role of the EU? What that's going to happen in the year 2022 uh, in terms of regulation, in terms of policy actions uh, for this Internet of Things? Three elements are very important for the Internet of Things. First, the free flow of data. Second, cybersecurity. And third, liability. And in 2022, the European strategy for data will culminate in the proposal for a data act. The European Cybersecurity Resilience Act will boost the EU's cybersecurity strategy. And lastly, the co-legislators will review the product liability directive. So what does that mean concretely for the Internet of Things in 2022? For data, let's stay with the examples. The fridge needs to be able to transfer data to an online shop, otherwise it can't make an order. A free flow of data requires legal certainty and access on the use of data. For cybersecurity, the self-driving car needs to interact safely with traffic systems and with other vehicles. So the EU legislators should address cybersecurity threats while at the same time avoiding fragmentation and promoting interoperability. And as regards liability, would a shipping company or a port use a connected container if it was unclear who has to pay in case of an accident? So the co-legislators should create clarity about the liability in cases of damage. To conclude, if in 2022 the European Union addresses the challenges for the Internet of Things applications, it can create a favorable environment for an innovative Internet of Things in Europe. And if the European Union achieves that, then on the worldwide stage, those European Union initiatives could play a pivotal role in setting global standards for the Internet of Things. And this is why the Internet of Things is a top issue to watch in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. That was uh, extremely effective. Uh, and I think it's going to be a very complex set uh, of legislation to, to come. We have looked at uh, the recovery from different aspects. We have looked at uh, the transition, green transition and digital transition. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, the question of the citizens and engagement of the citizens. Um, something that Vice President Karas uh, highlighted in his introduction. And I would like to ask Silvia Kotanidis, who is uh, uh, with us in the Citizens Policy Unit, following very closely the work of the Conference on the Future of Europe. As you know, the Conference of the Future of Europe is a very innovative uh, setup uh, associating institutions, but also uh, this time uh, citizens, and um, is going to deliver uh, in the year 2022. So, uh, Sylvia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. Um, the title of uh, the contribution on the 10 issues to watch was whether we are in uncharted waters. And uh, if I were to answer immediately, I would say that yes, we are, in my opinion, in uncharted waters. And uh, indeed, yes, also the uh, conference is uh, with the participation of citizens in it uh, has set uh, a new element of innovation in uh, how 
uh, this type of uh, consultations and uh, yeah, dialogues happen in at EU level. Now, I think that we are in uncharted waters for three main reasons. First, because of the novelty of the process. Then for the duration, uncertainty on the duration of uh, the conference. And third, because of the outcome of the conference itself. So on the um, process, um, indeed, we have said that uh, um, you have said it, Jen, and uh, that um, the conference has set this uh, novelty, this element of the um, strong and influential participation of uh, citizens in uh, uh, the conference. It will be necessary at a certain point to make a sort of uh, um, stock taking of what was the added value of such exercise and how to improve it. In my opinion, an element that could be taken into account for the future is a better communication of the process downstream to the member states and to the citizens. Uh, on the duration, um, we have seen that it took some time to approve uh, uh, the joint declaration, so to have uh, to kickstart the, the the conference, which have in a way shrunk uh, the duration of the conference from two years to one year. So, the question is whether now with the new measures, uh, because of uh, the pandemic not being over, uh, new measures that have delayed some events, uh, whether. Uh, the conference will reach uh, some uh, um, final conclusions by spring as expected. This is something that remains open. Uh, but to come to the third aspect, which is the outcome of the conference, uh, or I would better say the destination of our journey, um, I would say that this is a more of a thorny issue. In fact, uh, the conference has been kept open as to the outcomes from the beginning, from uh, all institutions, parliament included. Uh, but what we can say now, at least safely say, is that uh, most probably the conference will not bring treaty changes because it is not a convention in the true meaning of uh, the treaty. So what the treaties uh, request for treaty changes. But this does not uh, um, end the question in the sense that the conference could be still very useful for other um, purposes. For example, to bring political pressure to have such a reform convention for the future or political pressure to have uh, implemented some of the things that could already be implemented now uh, without changing the treaties. And there I refer, for example, to qualified majority voting, to the passerelle clauses, to the changes to the electoral uh, law and other innovations. Uh, for sure, in any case, what uh, will be uh, at the center of the attention will be the new role of citizens in the EU decision making. And on this tone, perhaps I also conclude my intervention by saying that Perhaps as uh, the, the pandemic has brought some uh, long lasting changes, perhaps in our life. Uh, likewise, also the conference will have put the spotlight on uh, the role of citizens for the future in EU decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silvia. Uh, certainly an issue to, to, to we have to watch in, in the year to come. Talking about citizens, I like to uh, move now to our next subject, which is uh, LGBTIQ equality an issue that is reflected in many resolutions of the Parliament. And as you know, the newly elected president of the Parliament, Mrs. Metzola, was very vocal in an inauguration speech about it. So uh, the European Commission has made uh, several promises on uh, LGBTIQ issues. And what can we expect? And that's what I'm going to uh, ask to uh, David de Groot, who is uh, expert on the issue within our citizens policy unit uh, in the EPRS. Over to you, David. Thank you, Etienne. Indeed, multiple promises have been made by the current commission to facilitate the lives of the LGBTIQ community in the union, especially with the LGBTIQ equality strategy. This year, 2022, we'll see a number of these promises be turned into actions. These actions one can classify in three broad categories. First of all, those enabling free movement. Second, those ensuring equality. And third, those actions designed to counter hate. Let's start with free movement. While free movement is guaranteed by the treaties and the free movement directive, rainbow families encounter many obstacles when exercising their free movement rights. When crossing borders, it's for example, not guaranteed that they, if married, will be treated as married, or that their children are considered theirs, even when they would have to make a decision on their behalf in, let's say, a hospital. This is an enormous burden for same-sex couples. The Commission has not updated the guidelines on the directive for over a decade. However, over the course of that period, much has happened. 
Not only has the number of member states having same-sex marriage increased from less than a handful to nearly half the union, and most of the others have in the meantime introduced a registered partnership, also the case law interpreting the free movement rights has developed immensely, and the amounts update of the guidelines will have to reflect all of this. Additionally, the Commission has announced that it will make a proposal for legislation ensuring that the parenthood validly attributed in one member state will be recognized in all member states. As Commission President von der Leyen said, if you are parent in one country, you are parent in every country. Such legislation would be of paramount importance for facilitating free movement and equal treatment. That brings me to the second category, equality. While the Horizontal Equality Directive proposed in 2008 is still on ice in the Council, the equality framework is moving ahead. If you have a right, this right might as well not exist if you did not have the means to enforce it. One of the proposals expected in 2022 concerns the strengthening of the national equality bodies, which help enforcement of the existing equality framework. Coming to the third and final category, countering hate. During the pandemic, LGBTIQ people have suffered increased hate speech and risk of violence. The Commission has very recently proposed an initiative to extend the list of EU crimes in the treaties to hate speech and hate crime. This will make it possible to establish minimum rules concerning the definition of hate speech and hate crime offenses, including on the grounds of sex and sexual orientation, and the consequent sanctions. Etienne, coming back uh, to your question, while there's still much to do to create a union of equality for all, 2022 will be a year when major steps are expected to make this vision come true. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David, for, for this presentation. Uh, just for, for you to know, we are now a bit more than 200 uh, in the WebEx and also I'm sure people uh, following us on WebStream. So that's extremely encouraging. Uh, questions have, are coming in in the Q&A session. So I invite you to use the Q&A session if you have uh, anything you want to share or a question uh, for later on. Please use it. Let's move it. Let's move now to uh, the place of Europe in the wider world. Uh, and we have still three presentations. And the first of them will be by Elena Lazarou on EU defense. Elena is acting head of our external policies unit, a specialist on uh, defense. Uh, and uh, there is a lot happening in 2022. The French presidency of the Council of Ministers had just started, and uh, they made uh, of defense uh, the key priority. So, what does 2022 offer? Uh, in terms of opportunities to move forward uh, with EU defence. And I didn't mention the pressure uh, that we now feel, uh, including on the neighbourhood. Over to you, uh, Elena. Thank you very much, Etienne, and lovely to listen to all the colleagues speaking. Um, in fact, the pressure, I think, is the most visible at the moment. Yesterday, the High Representative made a speech entitled Europe is in Danger, an expression he's used before. Uh, nonetheless, an expression which shows that if we were in any doubt about including defense issues in one of the issues to watch in 2022, uh, the situation in the Russian Ukrainian borders at the moment leaves no doubt that this is an issue that is on everyone's mind, and if I may say so, on everyone's television, with um, military equipment being sent off to, to the east uh, of Europe. Uh, but Taking a step back, uh, this is just one instance for which the EU needs to be prepared to uh, uh, both in terms of strategic culture and capabilities to cope with security and defense issues, which are largely growing uh, in the world. Threats have been rising in uh, amounts, but also in nature for the past decade. And a host of issues and proposals have uh, uh, have been part of EU policy in the past almost a decade uh, in 2023. Uh, with the aim to boost uh, EU security and defence on three in three major ways. One is to be more operational, to be able to deploy more operations. The second is to develop the European defence technological and industrial base in a way that it is uh, sovereign uh, it, or it has some kind of strategic sovereignty, but is also um, 
it's also uh, matched with the operational needs. Uh, and the third is to have, of course, the strategic culture and the strategic partners to be able to work with in the field of security and defense. And this, of course, we've seen uh, since the 2016 uh, EU um, global strategy uh, manifest itself in various initiatives, uh, including uh, the implementation plan on security and defense, including the European Defense Fund, which for the first time under this MFF is financing collaborative uh, research and development of defense capabilities across the EU, but also in initiatives such as military mobility and new types of CSDP operations. Now, looking to 2022, all the rest of it, I think our eyes should be open on at least three fronts. The first is what I would call the sort of institutional dynamism, because from all institutions, we have initiatives emanating uh, in the field of defense. As you mentioned, the French presidency of the Council has put strategic sovereignty, but also the flexibilization of EU defense as one of its objectives. Um, it also has proposed to host, um, together with the Commission, a summit on EU defense in February, which is the first ever of its kind. From the external action service, we have the ongoing process of strategic compass, which will culminate in March with the adoption of the compass by the European Council. And that is set to um, set up to create a framework for all the dimensions I mentioned. So operations, capabilities, but also resilience and partnerships. Um, and of course, from the Commission itself, under the new DG DFI for Defense Industry and Space, we have a host of initiatives coming out. Um, and roadmaps under the defense package, which we expect uh, next month. And that will be both in terms of uh, European defense capability development, but also space. Importantly, since we're in the European Parliament, we also have increasingly poignant uh, points by our members of the European Parliament under their own initiative reports in these areas for more oversight over how uh, the money spent in defense, but also for uh, more uh, flexibility, operationalizations and um, efficacy of, of our missions and operations, but also uh, and, uh, on, on, on our relationship with NATO, so making the best of the NATO relations. And I'd say to finish, this is the second point uh, and final to look at coming uh, this year. Um, EU-NATO relations, EU-US relations, we'll be seeing a new strategic concept being produced by NATO in June, but most importantly, the EU and the US are for the first time having their security and defense dialogue this year. Uh, but as the crisis right now demonstrates, there is still uh, more fine tuning to do, and it will all depend, I think, on political will, joint assessment of threats, um, and of course, um, the way the partnership moves forward. So I'll stop here, but there is a lot in this field to look for in 2022. Well, thank you, Elena, uh, for having uh, explained so much in so little time uh, on the subject that is developing constantly. Uh, you mentioned uh, strategic autonomy, and um, I think that this COVID crisis has shown uh, some vulnerabilities of Europe, and uh, one of them is the question of the semiconductors. Uh, and I would like to turn now to Guillaume, Guillaume Ragono, who is a member of our economic policies unit and who work on global supply chains. Um, this is an issue that uh, is of relevance for EU digital transition, economic recovery, and also geopolitical position in the world, uh, this situation of the global supply chain for semiconductors. So, uh, Guillaume, can you uh, tell us uh, why it is important and uh, what do we have to watch in the year to come? Over to you, Guillaume. Yes, thank you, Etienne. Now let's dive together in the fascinating world of semiconductors. For this, you just need to have a look at your smartphone. Uh, it is more powerful than the computers used by NASA in 1969 to send Apollo 11 to the moon. How is it possible? It is thanks to the semiconductors, also called chips, that uh, your smartphone has inside. Uh, chips are the tiny components that give electronic devices their ability to compute, store data, and interact with the physical world. And um, over the past three decades, uh, progress in uh, chips technology has been dramatic, and they have become faster, smaller, and cheaper. And today, they have become the engine of the digital transition. How has the pandemic affected the supply uh, of chips worldwide? Some of you in this big virtual audience may have been unable to buy a new car or have been faced with increased delays or prices. This is simply due by, uh, to the fact that the chip supply chain has been disrupted by the pandemics, affecting first the cars industry and then spreading to the other sectors using chips, as explained in detail in the paper that we prepared for this uh, conference. So why is the chip supply chain so fragile? Firstly, 
because the different production steps are located in only a few regions worldwide, and secondly, because it is impressively complex. Did you know that to produce a single chip, you need at least 1,000 steps and a, a single chip crosses uh, more than 70 borders before reaching its end consumer? So the chip shortages that we are seeing now will last into 2022 and even into 2024, as most solutions to the shortages have long lead times. For example, to build a new factory takes up to three years and five years until reaching full capacity. So in these conditions, how can Europe uh, secure its supply of chips? Over the past few decades, the share of Europe in uh, global production capacity of chips has declined and now reaches only 8%. Furthermore, in some production segments, like the production of the most cutting edge chips, Europe is totally absent. Of course, Europe has trends in the supply chain, for example, in pre-competitive research and development or in the production of manufacturing equipment, but is weak or absent in many others, for example, in chip design software. Demand for chips is rising quickly and worldwide all the producing regions are supporting uh, their uh, chips industry with unprecedented efforts. These regions, including Europe, have many options. For example, they can decide to specifically support some segments of the supply chain. They can also make sure that, that the industry has access to the highly skilled workers needed for uh, the industry. Or also they can protect their companies from foreign takeovers or technology transfers. So to conclude, Europe clearly needs to in increase the resilience of its chip supply. Many uh, initiatives have emerged at European level, and in the coming days, the European Commission is expected to put forward the European Chips Act, and we will see, Etienne, if it is up to the high stakes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very complex issue, a big challenge for, for Europe's uh, sovereignty. Uh, thank you for taking us through this. Uh, our last subject today, which is also about Europe within the, the wider world, is uh, the question of uh, nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, as we all know, we have the so-called uh, GCPOA, which is the uh, agreement about non-proliferation uh, with Iran. But there are quite a lot of other issues on the table in 2022, revisions of existing commitments and treaties. And uh, we have Beatrice Immelkamp, she's a senior analyst in our external policies unit, and I would like to ask her which progress she sees, uh, she considers possible uh, in the year to come on this front. Over to you, Beatrice. Thank you, Etienne. Um, I think the lyrics went like this. In Europe and America, there's a growing feeling of hysteria. For those of us who were around in the 1980s, you will remember this song. Written at the height of the Cold War, the song evoked a growing feeling of hysteria at the nuclear standoff between Russia and the US. What might save us, the song went, is if the Russians love their children too. Today, climate change and the coronavirus pandemic dominate the headlines. But beware, the threat from nuclear weapons has not gone away. The threat from nuclear weapons is actually greater today. If Sting wrote his song today, he would have to update the line. I hope the Russians, Chinese, North Koreans, Indians, Pakistanis, and soon the Iranians love their children too. Today, nine states in the world have nuclear weapons. The efforts of the international community are focused on ensuring that no additional states acquire nuclear weapons, and obviously that none of them will ever be used. In 2022, there are three things to watch in this respect. The first is the 10th review conference of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which was scheduled to take place in January, but has been postponed to August. The outcome of this review conference will be very important if the international community wants to stop additional countries from acquiring nuclear weapons. The second event to look out for is the first meeting of the states parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which will take place in April. A growing number of countries is frustrated that nuclear weapon states are not taking any serious steps to actually get rid of nuclear weapons 
which is what they promised to do 50 years ago. These countries have drawn up a rival treaty that actually prohibits nuclear weapons. Thirdly, 2022 will also be decisive to determining the future of the nuclear agreement with Iran. The agreement was intended to stop Iran from turning its civilian nuclear program into a military one. Unfortunately, as we know, President Trump withdrew the US from the agreement. In response, Iran has resumed its nuclear weapons program and is getting very close to having the means to build a nuclear bomb. I elaborate on all three topics in my paper where you will find more information. I also suggest ways in which the EU could help to diffuse tensions with Iran's neighbors, which could be essential to saving the nuclear agreement. Who would have thought that a song from the 1980s would still be so relevant in 2022? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Beatrix, and, and thank you also for for bringing this uh, musical element uh, in this uh, in this very uh, heavy uh, subject and difficult subject. There is a, actually a question that just came in on uh, on Iran, uh, but before uh, giving the the floor to you again, Beatrix, on this, I just wanted to to say something about the editorial choices we have done for this. Uh, 10 issues to watch. As um, you might have noticed in comparison to previous editions, we didn't focus on any particular country or region uh, this time uh, because simply it would have been too much. We could, of course, I mean, we are heading to the midterm election in the US. Uh, there are tensions between China and Taiwan. There are tensions in our neighborhood uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, because of that, we decided to focus more on um, on thematic issues such as uh, defense, such as non-proliferation, but also uh, these so-called internal policies that have implications uh, for, uh, for third countries and the wider world. Uh, but I come back to you, Beatrix, and I read a question that came in the chat uh, from uh, Piotr, and this question, uh, I read it, it's easier. You mentioned there are ways in which the EU could help uh, to diffuse tensions between Iran and its neighbors. And uh, the question reads out, could you elaborate on how the EU uh, and the parliament, more specifically, could help to diffuse tension uh, in the region? Uh, back, back to you already. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Thank you, Etienne. Well, experts believe that the EU should facilitate a regional dialogue on security issues with Iran and its Arab neighbors. Se several Arab Gulf states have already reached out to Iran in a sign of rapprochement that uh, experts believe the EU should support. Um, only regional cooperation and a strategic dialogue that also addresses Iran's security concerns will create the optimal conditions for non-proliferation in the region. And the Council has actually mandated the High Representative to engage with all parties in the Gulf region to reduce tension, um, support political dialogue, and promote political regional solution. Um, Parliament could support these efforts through its long experience with mediation in, in crisis regions. I'm thinking in particular about the Young Political Leaders Programme. Um, this programme cooperates with young political leaders in select countries. So, uh, recent activities have targeted, for example, young leaders from Israel and Palestine and Armenia and Azerbaijan. A step, first step would be to bring together young leaders from Iran and the neighboring Gulf states uh, at the parliament for, for, a, a, for dialogue, basically. So these would be the concrete suggestions what the EU and parliament in particular could do in this respect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beatrix. Um, now, I think I have uh, questions that relate to, uh, to the, let's say, to, to climate um, and the green transition. Uh, one question is asking if, uh, do all sectors face the same challenges in their contribution to reducing emissions while driving the economy forward? And, um, and the other one uh, on the same, um, on the same sector is why it is generally agreed uh, by economists worldwide that economic growth is the norm to be followed. Um, so are there differences between the, the sectors and why, um, why do the uh, economists agree uh, that economic growth is the norm uh, to, be, to be followed? I, uh, 
I think this question will be for uh, I think this question will be for Enrique. I have another one um, which is about uh, yeah, you refer to a great scope for flexibility and voluntary actions in your country strategic planning referring to agriculture. Could you give uh, some examples of countries' choices that could go in the direction of a more sustainable agriculture? I think this 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 one um, this one for would be for for Raquel. So maybe first Enrique on the challenges of the of the specific sectors and um, why the economists um, uh, agreed that uh, economic growth is the norm. And then I would move to you, Raquel. First, first to you, Enrique. Uh, thank you very much, Etienne. Um, well, the not all sectors will have the same challenges challenges in in achieving decarbonization. One of the most challenging uh, sectors is one that was touched. By, by by our colleague uh, Rochelle, uh, that it's agriculture because of the complexity of the of the st stakeholders that it involves, and that and it's one where global efforts need to be need to be pushed forward into changing how we farm, how we distribute, and how we consume food. Um, just a, a, a figure. Uh, roughly a third of the food that it's produced each year it's thrown to waste. And with that, we have a, a, a roughly 8% greenhouse gas emissions attached to that. So, um, to tackle uh, the decarbonization in this sector, it will depend greatly on the consumer side that will have to demand uh, more sustainable alternatives. Uh, we, we would have to see greater um, uh, research and development investment and incentives in the public sector for specifically directed for land use management and also see an expansion in carbon sinks. Um, on your second question, um, in terms of the, um, of the general acceptance of uh, economic growth as, a, as the rule to follow, uh, it is agreed that, that it has the potential to drive uh, societal well-being and, and, and equity. And it is also agreed that tax revenue from economic growth can then be used to achieve what we were just talking about earlier, the radical decoupling. Still, some, some, some um, push for, for, for post-growth ideas, such as the degrowth and slow growth that I mentioned in the, uh, that I mentioned before, where degrowth, for example, um, they argue that the economic, the, the uncontrolled economic growth that we, that we see could result in resource scarcity and environmental degradation. Pass to you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Enrique, for this. Uh, maybe Raquel, on the on the this question on the examples of uh, uh, agriculture or uh, more sustainable agriculture in some in some in some countries, that you can give us a few examples of what you have in mind for this. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I will give you two examples of um, some elements I mentioned during the presentation before. Um, one is about what I mentioned in, term of, in terms of um, uh, being more ambitious. Uh, the newly approved legislation sets certain thresholds, such as 25% of the uh, farm payments should be linked to measures which are uh, bene uh, beneficial for the environment and the climate action. So, uh, more ambitious than this would mean that, like, for example, a country would set this threshold higher than 25% or even much higher. Let's see what will happen in the discussions with the uh, commissions during 2022. And another um, example is um, related to uh, what I mentioned before in terms of deterioration of resources and water. There are a number of measures that could be included under this group of measures which can be uh, sustained by EU funds. Uh, some of them are really old and well known to farmers, such as like uh, choosing the right crops, the right um, irrigation schedule, the right uh, plan uh, planting uh, time, etc. So these are um, 
longly known practices that could be uh, funded. And then there are new measures which go under the name of precision agriculture, which means introducing new technologies into the farm and uh, using technologies which help the farmer to know at which moment and uh, on which parcel uh, there is need of water, fertilizers, etc., so that there is um, a lot of saving in terms of input and a lot of uh, saving in terms of deterioration of the um, environment. Thank, thank you, thank you, Raquel, for for this. Uh, I have a question on the on the inflation and a question coming from Andrea. The question is uh, relatively simple. It's uh, what are the reasons for the high inflation rates uh, we see? So uh, I, I think this question will be for you, uh, for you, uh, Martin. Uh, and then I have another one on the on the. Um, uh, on the structure of the global supply chain and the main producing regions. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the structure of the global supply chain and the main producing regions? But let's take, uh, I think it will be for you, Guillaume, but let's take first Martin and um, um, and then Guillaume get ready also for, for taking the project after. So, Martin, what are the reasons for the high inflation rates that we see? Yeah, that is, of course, a very pertinent... Well, you could write a book probably on this, but... Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, it's a very pertinent question and uh, one could go on quite a, a bit, but uh, I think what we are currently seeing is inflation pressure concentrated in very specific sectors, uh, especially energy. And this is caused by uh, supply bottlenecks and energy imports. And when we usually talk about uh, inflation, we talk about in, uh, price pressure on a very broad uh, basis. And this is not what we are seeing today. Uh, more importantly, uh, this price pressure is supply side driven as opposed to demand side driven. And here the ECB lever is rather limited. But to answer your uh, question more specifically, I think we need to distinguish between short term and long term effects. Um, in the short term, uh, there are two main factors uh, distorting uh, the inflation picture, if you will. And that is first, uh, the increase in energy prices, which has a strong impact on uh, headline inflation. And the second one is the base effect due to a temporary fall in prices in the very beginning of the COVID-19 recession. And if we would correct for both of these uh, distortions by looking at core inflation and inflation over 24 months, so uh, annualized inflation over 24 months, uh, one would find inflation at 1.4%. In the medium run, however, supply constraints uh, indeed uh, might uh, more persistent than expected. Guillaume Ragonot uh, explained that uh, with the semiconductors and uh, this uh, cost pressure might pass on to prices. However, uh, assuming they are not going to intensify uh, these ongoing supply chain issues are going to translate into higher price levels, but not uh, to an elevated inflation rate. For that, uh, supply chain disruptions would need to actually aggravate even further. And to just add a number to that, in the recent World Economic Outlook by the IMF, uh, they calculated that supply disruption already added one percentage point to core inflation worldwide in 2021. Now, what the ECB will look at very, very closely is wage growth. Uh, Philip Lane, the executive board member of the ECB, uh, mentioned that in an interview earlier this week, uh, and he said that if uh, for inflation to be at their target, the symmetric 2% target, and allowing for a typical increase in labor productivity uh, of around 1%, then wages should be growing by around 3% a year on average in order to be consistent with the 2% target. Uh, right now, we, we don't have any evidence of substantial wage increases. And uh, maybe to conclude my answer, uh, there are many wild cards in the game, uh, including second round effects, inflation expectations, also uh, climate change. So it re remains to be seen how this plays out, we uh, 
attempt to answer so the question in, in, in our publication, but the ECB is well advised to be flexible in their mon monetary policy going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, extremely, extremely interest, interesting field of reflection and clearly something to watch in the year to come. And uh, thank you for sharing with, with us. Uh, I think the other question, uh, Yom, is, is for you uh, about um, the structure of the of the supply chain uh, globally um, and 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 the regions, the main producing regions. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Etienne. Well, in terms of uh, production geography, in fact, Asia with China, Japan, South Korea and Taiwan represent together uh, more than 70 percent of global production capacity for semiconductors. And then you have the United States with 13 percent and uh, Europe with 8 percent, as I said before. In fact, the, the chip supply chain is consists in more or less three big steps. First, the design of the chips then the production of itself of the chip involving foundries, which are extremely capital intensive. Uh, a new factory costs around 15 to 20 billion dollars, which is not far from the amount uh, needed to organize Olympic Games. Uh, and then you have the final step, the assembly, testing and packaging of the chips, which is a step which is more uh, labor intensive. Uh, and in this supply chain, you have some companies that are focused on some specific steps or uh, some companies that do all the steps together, but they are they have become uh, less and less frequent. Uh, importantly, this global supply chain includes what we call choke points, meaning steps in the supply chain where uh, a single country holds more than 75% uh, of the segments, which makes the supply chain quite uh, fra fragile. Um, voila. And to finish, we have seen in the past years a shift in the global uh, production capacity, as I explained during my presentation. And we can wonder why why has Europe lost ground? In fact, what have what uh, recent studies have shown is that state support has proved to be uh, crucial in attracting investment in the sectors. And the most important indicator is the cost of operating a factory, which can be 30% uh, lower in Taiwan, for example, or in China, because the companies receive uh, grants uh, to build the factory, to pay uh, their energy, to uh, land prices are lower, et cetera, et cetera. And we will see if the new push in Europe will uh, reversed this trend, especially as chips have are becoming more and more important for our economy, as we have seen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Guillaume. Uh, I have a question. I think it's a bit of a difficult one for, for Michael, uh, coming from Manuel. And Manuel is uh, saying 2022 could be the year of the emergence of digital parallel universe in the form of metaverses. It might require regulation for economic activities. If you have any views on this, uh, think about it. Uh, I have another question, uh, which is, I think, for uh, for Alessandro. Um, you mentioned the national plans concerning recovery by the various uh, member states that are submitted to the European institutions. Um, and if you could tell us what is out already uh, and not uh, if you have if you have that. Um, and I think this is it for the, the question, let's say, on the economic uh, field. And then there will be a couple of questions uh, on foreign affairs and citizens. And I will take the sort of two clusters last. So uh, maybe, Mikhail, if you have any views on this, um, and then Alessandro, first of you, first to you, Mikhail. Yes, thank you. Great question. Um, thank you very much. Indeed, the metaverse, there's a lot of talking about um, about that. Um, first of all, it's it's a big term. Um, and the question is a bit, uh, what does it mean specifically in 2022? 2022 is going to be still a very early time for, for the metaverse. So it's starting to emerge. Um, so in 2022, I think it will not be there yet, the metaverse, but it's a process and 
it might never be there in a way it's described now by some companies, but it's a process that there's more and more of this parallel reality as, as was mentioned in the question. So the question is there need for, for specific relation on that. Also for that, I think it's a bit early to say there's definitely a need for the regulation um, that I mentioned earlier on the Internet of Things, because there are many elements of Internet of Things in this parallel um, reality. There's definitely need for regulation on artificial intelligence that's, that's playing a big role. That's also something that is in the pipeline currently. There is, of course, a need for very big need for increased cybersecurity. Another thing um, I mentioned earlier, that's also relating to Internet of Things, uh, but also to the um, parallel reality metaverse in general. And lastly, I think also the platforms regulations that is um, happening right now is playing a role there as well, depending on in which metaverse you'll be in, because there might not be one metaverse, there might be different ones, different ecosystems. So I think um, all these play a role and all these are uh, on the way and that's and that's very good. We need to take into consideration that there is this development, I think it is being taken into account and whether there's a need for a specific horizontal regulation of that, that is indeed the big question, I think not for 2022, but maybe the year after uh, we will ask ourselves that that question when we have a bit, when the development has continued a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, now to you, Alessandro, on the national plans. And there is another one coming. I think it is for you. It's about the Just Transition Fund. And uh, the question uh, reads as follows. It's from Andreas Brieger, and it says many regions that are not included uh, in the uh, Just Transition Fund will face huge transition disruptions without timely assistance. It's always better to address issues with uh, foresight than uh, reacting too late. How do you assess existing and future EU instrument funds? That's also a big question. Uh, over to you, Alessandro, if you can share something on this. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, indeed, uh, I could speak uh, for a long time uh, on uh, these questions, but I'll uh, try to be brief. Um, as far as uh, national plans uh, are concerned, um, most of them have been uh, approved uh, by the Commission and they are up and running. 22 plans uh, um, are in this uh, situation right now. Uh, and for these uh, 22 countries, uh, the pre-financing uh, has already been uh, disbursed. And uh, um, what is interesting in the recovery and resilience facility, the main uh, instrument uh, to spend the resources from next generation EU, is th that it introduces uh, some innovations uh, uh, in EU budgetary instruments. Uh, in particular, uh, it is a performance-based or results-based instrument. So uh, there is a pre-financing, but then next payment will be linked to the achievement of uh, milestones and targets uh, in the implementation of uh, investments and reforms. Uh, so for 22 countries, we are at this stage. And actually for one country, Spain, uh, the first payment uh, has already been disbursed by the Commission. And uh, there are um, three other countries that uh, have already sent uh, in uh, their first payment request, um, Greece, uh, Italy and France. So um, the remaining five countries, what's the situation uh, there? Um, there were um, two countries uh, that uh, have sent uh, uh, a bit late their plans, uh, so uh, Bulgaria and Sweden for different re uh, reasons. So these uh, plans are still uh, being assessed by the Commission. And the same applies uh, for Hungary and Poland. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, for this member state, uh, the plan uh, has not yet been uh, um, produced uh, or sent to the Commission uh, because uh, there were elections uh, and then uh, uh, the formation of the government uh, took uh, some time. Uh, and the Dutch plan is expected uh, in spring. Um, so um, this is a brief overview of the state of play right now. And as for the Just Transition Fund, uh, indeed, uh, uh, this is um, a very important instrument, and uh, as um, I think many 
uh, in our audience uh, uh, are aware of. Uh, this was also something that uh, uh, Parliament uh, pushed for um, very strongly in the MFF uh, negotiations um, to uh, complement the efforts towards the green transition with uh, support to the regions and sectors most exposed uh, to the costs of the transition. Uh, and there, um, of course, uh, um, resources uh, um, needed are uh, quite significant, but uh, there is also another uh, proposal on the table uh, from the Commission to uh, beef up uh, these resources uh, with uh, um, a social climate fund. So uh, it's not the end of the story, uh, more should be coming. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro. Then I have a question, as I said, on, on issues that are more related to, to citizens. Uh, one is about this uh, recognition of parenthood across the European Union. And uh, what do you expect from the Commission proposal, David, if uh, the Commission is to make a proposal on this uh, apparent in the member state, is apparent in all member states? Uh, how should it look like if, if uh, like it's a question by uh, Katarina? Um, yeah, I expect a parenthood proposal, uh, which is at the moment still being consulted in the uh, expert group on the recognition of parenthood. I expect it to be an Article 81 uh, paragraph 3 TFU proposal. So that means uh, private international law and, on, and then specifically uh, based on family law. And that means also that the council will have to uh, decide unanimously only after consulting uh, Parliament. Uh, so uh, that might cause some troubles um, and it will possibly, it might also be in conjunction with Article 21, which would be a bit more innovative. But uh, so I expect it to be a private international law um, instrument, uh, harmonizing or at least regularizing certain rules on which law is applicable to the parenthood, enabling that um, the parenthood can be more easily recognized when it's established in one member state in another member state. But yeah, it might end up in a, possibly an enhanced co a cooperation. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, there are several questions. Now questions are coming in. It's always like that at the end of an event, but I just uh, cannot take all of them. But uh, on the conference of the future of Europe, what is coming several times is the question of the citizens, the innovation of the citizens, uh, their participation to the conference. And, um, and uh, what can we expect from this new dimension in this dialogue uh, with the institutions within that framework of the of the conference? Uh, what can we expect from the citizens? Um, uh, Sylvia, I think it's for you. Yes, uh, thank you, Etienne. This is uh, uh, actually is a bit of the big question because uh, we have seen that the how the conference was designed and uh, how. Uh, this idea was uh, welcomed by um, in Parliament for sure, but also by other stakeholders. Uh, was uh, on paper very successful. We have seen. Uh, I followed personally some of the um, first uh, panels of the citizens, and uh, one has to say that the involvement and the um, enthusiasm that they had in this was uh, extremely uh, even touching. And now, um, I think in this respect, one has to be um, also quite uh, clear on what uh, the citizens panels will mean in terms of institutional effect uh, and uh, in terms of effect on the EU, uh, on the shaping of uh, the EU. Uh, they were necessary for sure, uh, because it was, necessary, it was necessary to establish a dialogue with the citizens, but uh, um, we are still um, under a representative democracy. So, um, the citizens' panels did not really replace uh, representative democracy. They complemented. So um, that was uh, clear in Parliament from the beginning. And uh, the big challenge is how to make this message pass through uh, the citizens' panels because um, the enthusiasm is very high. And uh, I also um, 
had the feeling that uh, in some of the discussions in the more advanced discussions of the citizens panels, there was sort of expectation that all the uh, recommendations will be taken on board. Um, now, this obviously will not be the case because there are um, national interests, there are political interests, and there are also there is also the feasibility under the current um, design of the conference. So we cannot change, for example, competences. That is not possible because we need treaty changes. Uh, we cannot change uh, um, the, how certain institutions function uh, within the EU. Uh, most probably this will also require treaty change. So it will be a very um, delicate balance uh, in that respect. And uh, uh, for this, I think uh, that we have to, um, so to say, trust a bit the uh, discussion that is ongoing and uh, and hope that uh, at least this uh, message is passed for the future. What I would like to signal is that there is a um, resolution of parliament that already in July 2021 was uh, uh, was issued that uh, in fact endorsed very much a modernization of the way in which uh, citizens are consulted. So in the way in which uh, um, the EU connects to the citizens, not only with the citizens consultation, but also through platforms, through other means that uh, make the voices of the citizens heard. Now, this uh, resolution in fact mentioned in some mentions in some parts how to manage expectations. And this is very important because uh, uh, I think this is uh, um, an aspect that uh, um, it's uh, it's absolutely crucial in how for the future this type of uh, of exercises will be run. Uh, just to finish on that, this resolution endorses a sort of uh, uh, permanent mechanism, so which can uh, fit into uh, the the annual and legislative cycle. I would say so. In a way, the first half of the year to have a consultation of citizens on the priorities, for example. Uh, policy priorities that could fit in afterwards in the uh, annual uh, program, Commission's annual program, and in the State of the Union address. Um, this not very. This idea is not very developed, but this is a bit in uh, in uh, embryo uh, the um, idea that is proposed by Parliament. So I hope this is a satisfactory answer. <laughs> No, thank you. That's actually actually very very detailed. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. And, uh, clearly, there is there will still be a lot to happen uh, on the conference. And uh, as everyone knows, the EPRS is very much backing the work of the members of Parliament on this uh, on various fronts. I have a couple of questions on external relation uh, and and the defence. Uh, uh, one of them is about actually space policy, and it's very interesting. It's coming from Tikoda. There are increasingly more headlines about the testing of nuclear capable hypersonic missiles, such as China's latest test in space. Is the EU taking any concrete actions to address this threat, or are there plans to use the EDF, European Defence Fund, uh, to develop uh, new deterrent capabilities? So, uh, space policy, a very interesting question. I, th I think it's either for Beatrice or for Elena, but I think it's for Elena. And um, um, Another question uh, is about the, the transatlantic relation. Uh, how is it going? Uh, AUKUS is mentioned in the question and uh, what can we expect there? I said we on purpose didn't address um, you know, specific countries, but the transatlantic relation is uh, extremely important. And I think it would be good if you could give your view, uh, Elena. Uh, and maybe linked to that is about the strategic compass and how much the strategic compass will be uh, with enable the EU to merge the different specific interests by its member states into a common vision. Uh, a lot. Uh, if you could keep your remarks short, because time is flying over to you, Elena. I think and this will be the last uh, question I will take. For today. Thank you, Etienne. Okay, now it's officially three o'clock, so I don't know how much time I have to answer these very easy questions, but let me try to tackle them with some key points and then happy to discuss with those who asked over the phone and, and often you see to direct them to our publications. On space, space is very interesting in the sense that it's a dual use area. The EU, as you know, has an EU space program. Alessandro will correct me, but I think now under the current MFF, it's about 15 billion in current prices, 14.8. Um, but, uh, but what's interesting about space and defense is that that sort of line between the, the defense nature of space and the civil use of space is increasingly becoming very relevant. And as you know, the EU does not have a mandate to spend on, on anything with military implications, same with the defense fund, but increasingly dual use technology, which is 
useful for space and space defense is also developed in the civilian sector. Practically, what does this mean? And you ask, what is, is the EU doing anything about it? First and foremost, yesterday Thierry Breton said that uh, in the next year the, the EU will propose, so the Commission will propose the EU space and defense strategy to fit in with the strategic compass. So we're looking forward to that. And the strategic compass under the resilience basket has space and cyber as the two and maritime as three domains we really have to focus on. Looking back to what's happened so far, what we can see is that under PESCO, which is the Permanent Structured Cooperation on Defense, we have a number of collaborative programs and projects, both for situational awareness in space, but also to intercept threats in space. And as you know, as you may know, PESCO projects get increased funding from the European Defense Fund. We have an action plan on synergies between space, defense, and civil in, uh, space, civil, and defense industry, which facilitates investment in technology that is also useful for space defense. So that's a few things on that because I don't want to go further into it, but happy to discuss. On transatlantic relations, I hinted to it at the end of my presentation. It's an interesting year. We have the first EU-US high-level security and defense dialogue, something the EU has been calling for for a while. Uh, we've had Biden visit and have meetings with the EU in various formats, with the EU, with those who are NATO members and within the G7 and commit to a better and more um, cooperative transatlantic relationship, even stronger than pro-Trump, uh, theoretically. We've had some malentendus with AUKUS and the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which I'm sure you've read about in, in the think tank community. But broadly, I think on the level of initiatives, we're at a very interesting point. There's the Trade and Technology Council also ongoing, which is linked to security and defense threats. And there is, uh, according to the High Representative, an extremely high level of consultation at the moment with the ongoing discussions with Russia. So I think there is a lot of momentum to look at this year. On the strategic compass, um, bringing together member states threat perceptions that's the million dollar question what i can say is that the strategic compass has been the first time that member states have committed to a collective exercise of threat assessments carried out confidentially what's been produced is a long list of threats without a prioritization and that's a criticism by many experts that we have a really big what they call christmas tree of threats but we don't actually have number one two three and that is partially due to uh, the varying threats based in member state perceptions. But what we're looking to is also using the treaty potential, the solidarity and mutual assistance clauses that the treaty offers to boost that sense of sharing threats because at each moment of threat, it's assumed that the EU will be there to support a member state. And that's that utilization of the treaty would be a way to move to a more comprehensive collective uh, th agreement on threats. And I encourage you to read our publication uh, led by Etienne and with a big contribution by Silvia on this underused treaty potential. So I end here for lack of time, but obviously these are huge questions to tackle. So I, I'm sorry if I didn't manage to respond to all of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. And thank you very much, colleagues, for this extremely interesting afternoon. And thank you also to the audience. Uh, I just I just like to retain three points. First, I think the journey that we did today through the 10 issues to watch uh, show us how much global the issues are. We are used in the uh, EU jargon to use internal policies, external policies, but in fact, these categories are challenged. Climate change, digital transformation, the question of semiconductors, all these issues have a global dimension. And this brings me to a sort of second point. Uh, there is a debate going on right now uh, at EU level on EU as a power, on sovereignty, on strategic autonomy. I don't want to enter into this debate about the words, but what is clear and what makes uh, the U Europe powerful and special is uh, to large extent due to these so-called internal policies, the capacity to regulate, to set standards and to become uh, that become world standard. And this is very much what uh, Anu Bradford, the, the Columbia authors call uh, the Brussels effect in her book. And the third point uh, out of the discussions today that I would like to retain is the citizens dimension. What is special about the EU uh, project, but also about the EU as institution, it's a centrality of the human dimension. Uh, and this is also something special about the EU place in the world and uh, these uh, strengths uh, the EU has because uh, it's about democracy. 
And as President Kara said in his introduction, it's uh, important and crucial for institutions to keep constantly this linkage between institutions and citizens and to build bridges. The elections to the European Parliament in, are in the two and a half years, and we have uh, also the Conference on the Future of Europe that is raising a lot of hope and is uh, triggering a very interesting dynamic. Uh, I'd like to stop here. I'd like to thank uh, again the Vice President for his inspiring and encouraging remarks. Of course, authors and presenters today, I'm very proud of all of you, the contributors to the debate online. We had uh, colleagues from national parliaments, from permanent representations, from academia, all over Europe and even beyond. That's great that uh, we had you today with us. Um, also, I would like to say that uh, the 10 issues to watch is an important, but it's one of about a thousand publications that the EPRS is doing over the year, and these publications are public good, and I encourage you to make good use of them. And finally, uh, there are also colleagues behind the scene. You see two uh, uh, grey squares there, and I would like to thank very much uh, Isabel Godel and, and Cecile Charlier, who have been helping us a lot to prepare this event and to make it a success behind the scenes. So thank you to all of them. I wish you a good rest of the day and a good afternoon. Bye-bye.